All right, so um, today we are going to go through, we're going to talk about the company foundation. This, this piece of, of the training actually is uh, probably one of the most important uh, pieces of, uh, of why this company is successful. So we've got joining us today, do you care if I introduce you a little, Annette? We've got Annette Judd. Annette actually just joined us um, last week, two weeks ago, something like that. Anyway, Annette... Uh, worked as an agent here in Utah for how many years? 30. 30 years and, and moved over to Hawaii. So she just moved back from being an agent in Hawaii to here. Like why would anybody ever do that, right? I was a broker <laughs> during layups. But you have to know that when you're with Century 21 anywhere else in the world and you watch number one, you watch number one. I was with Century 21 over in Wailea and I watched number one and my company was trying to mimic number one. And uh, when Rick Davidson came over, I went, what does he know that I don't know? Well, why am I here trying to make number 14 number one when I can just go join number one? Which a lot of these guys may, may not even know who Rick Davidson is. Do you, oh. Who knows who Rick Davidson is? So like three hands. So, okay. so Rick Davidson actually was the CEO of Century 21 globally. So across the whole country, or the globe, I guess, the world is he was the CEO and he uh, a few months ago made the decision that it was time to be done doing that and so he uh, gave his notice and said I'm gonna go work with Century 21 Everest and so he has now joined the Everest group so so really this is probably a good segue into starting this the, the company is owned today by Everest group which is then owned by George Morris and John Syed and um, and so uh, he came to be, he is now the president of Everest Group, meaning he is overseeing both the California operation and Utah in terms of uh, the Everest Group. So anyway, so yeah, Annette said, I want to go see what does he know that I don't know. And so uh, she's here today to learn some of the things of what has made Everest so successful and why specifically has this office been the number one office for Century 21 for the past number of in years. In less so. than a decade. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so that's where we're going to go today. So so here's where I want to start with that. So in 2009, what happened is George Morris, John Syed, there were five people sitting at a table, and I don't know who that I could name all five of the people, but there were five people sitting at a table, and George made the comment of, we should go start a real estate company. Now, for you guys that may not be aware, what was happening to the real estate market in 2009. It was really bad. It was tumbling. Yeah, it was bad. It was, in all of our, everyone here, I believe, anyways, lifetime, like it was the worst real estate market in, in all of us, all of our lifetime. It, and the only time it's ever been worse, the economy and things, was the Great Depression. And so it was a bad time. So they're sitting at the table and George says, we should go start a real estate company and John Syed, who's one of the other main owners of the company, said, you know, if anybody else said that, I would tell you you were crazy, but because it's you, I, I would say let's do it. So as they talked about it, and they talked about creating this company th uh, that they wanted to, to build, that they foresaw, what, th what they talked about is, you know, their, the failure rate in real estate, if you guys know it or not, is very, very high. Like... 13 out of 14 people who start into real estate will be gone within their first two years of, of starting real estate. So very high failure rate. In fact, there's only one one industry that's worse than real estate in terms of failure. Any ideas? Professional sports. Professional sports? What? What did you say? No, same, same, same thing. Okay. So, and and that could be so. Brad saying insurance. The 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 one that and and I don't know about maybe professional sports would be but. but Multi-level marketing is the one that has the, the higher fail rate. And so why? Why, it, why would it be that multi-level marketing and also um, real estate would have such a high fail rate? Huh? There's a false belief that it's easy money. That's right. There's this belief that you can make a ton of money, which is true, you can make a ton of money, and that it's easy, right? But hopefully all of you have been around long enough to see that it's not really, it's simple, but it's not easy. 
So it is a very simple business, but it's not easy. So what they decided is, you know what, we want to create a company where, you know, there's going to be a lot of failure in real estate, but it's not going to be okay to fail with us. And so what they wanted to do is figure out how do we come up, go about putting together a company that will help people to be able to become their very best. So the mission of this company, the overall mission, the objective of what George and John want to have take place, and you will hear John say this, or, or excuse me, well John, but George more so I hear say it over and over and over again, is they don't care how much money you make in this business because more important than the money that you're gonna make in this business is who you become. So the most important thing for you is to focus on who do you need to become? Who do, you, who do you need to become in order to make that money? So if you do that, if you'll focus on who you need to become, the money will show up all on its own. You don't even have to worry about that. So, so one of the first things they said is, in terms of us creating this company, what we need is we need agents who will be coachable. So probably the number one thing that we at Century 21 would ask of you as an agent is to be coachable. Your, your most important thing is to be coachable, to be willing to say, okay, maybe there is something to this to where they know what they're talking about and be willing to be coached. Don't just assume that you already have it all figured out, you know everything that, that you need to do. One of the things that, uh, that John likes to say is, every one of you, you are all exceptional people. Every one of you is an exceptional person, but what you're not is an exception to the rules of success. If you wanted to bake a cake, is there a process for that? What, what is it? What's the process? It's a recipe. Yeah, it's a recipe, right? And if you follow the recipe, what should happen? Yeah, cake. Yummy. You end up with a cake, right? Same thing applies to you in terms of your success in real estate. There is a process that if you will follow this process, if you will follow the steps of this recipe, you will be a successful person. But you've got to be willing to follow the steps of this. So, so as they sat down and looked at it, what happened is they developed something that's called the, the company foundation. Now some of you have probably heard them talk about the foundation and we're going to go through it in detail. But before we get to the foundation, if you were going to build a house today, so you went out and you, you dig a hole to build a house, what do you put in before you put in the foundation? So why? What, do, what is it about the footings? What do they do? The footings keep the walls from, um, the footings are put in deep enough so that they don't freeze so the walls won't crumble. Okay, good. There's plumb that are there to shape the building's going to be, okay. there's a solid foundation. Okay, good. So it's kind of the foundation to the foundation, right? Were you going to say something else, Brad? Well, the footings are actually, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't hear what she said, so I might be repeating you. No, go ahead. They, uh, are designed to distribute the weight so the house remains stable. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so perfect. I love that. That is probably the best way of explaining it that I, I could give, is they are going to keep everything stable and in place so that the, the foundation is in place and ready to go. So in terms of the company, one of the things that we want to, and you will notice that you're going to hear quite often within uh, Century 21, is uh, talk about these footings to the foundation, okay? So I'm going to actually draw this, though, as like a, uh, well, we'll see if you can tell me what it is when I'm done drawing. It's a spaceship. It's a spaceship. <laughs> Love it. So what is that? I heard somebody say it. Three-legged stool. Yeah, three-legged stool, okay? So think of it that way. As far as these footings to the foundation, so we're going to go through and talk about the company foundation, but before we get to that, we first need to stop and talk about the footings to the foundation because there are some things, and if you thought about it, if I had actually up here, I keep thinking I need to go find one that I could bring as an actual object for you guys to see, is if I had a three-legged stool that was sitting up here, though, and I pulled one of the legs off, what happens? Yeah, it, I could probably keep it balanced, but it's not going to be very, it's not going to be as easy as with all three legs, right? What if I pull off two of them? Yeah, I'm probably not going to be able to stay standing. So in terms of this, think of this as, as, as being you. This stool is you. There are three legs to the, to this, to the stool that we need to be concerned with. The first one is our health, okay? So you're going to notice as we go through and we talk about this today that 
we're talking about more than just real estate because at the, really that is the secret to the success. So like if, if Annette asking, what is it that has made Century 21 Everest number one? Well, it all starts with this. We are worried about you more so than just, it's not all just about the real estate business for you. It's about, are you do, being healthy? Are you taking care of your body? So not just your physical health, but mental, emotional, all of those things, the health. The second one is going to be, and these aren't in any any uh, order. specific order yet. So your relationships. Second is going to be the relationships that you have. So when we talk about relationships, we're, we're talking about the relationship you have to yourself, the relationship you have to some higher power, you know, whether you want to, you know, if it's a tree for you, that, you know, you the trees or whatever, then that's fine. But some higher power. Some people would call it God, whatever you want to do. But your relationship with yourself, with some supreme being out there, or whatever it is you want, you know, nature, whatever you want to call it, your family, your spouse, children, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, whatever, whatever that is for you, the relationships. But that is important as well, is that you have those things in place. And then finally, would be we would say the money or the business, your real estate, whatever. So there are three different areas that you need to focus on. Now, why is that important? Why would it be important that we focus on all three of these areas? Anybody here heard of Larry Miller? <laughs> yeah, we all know who Larry Miller is, right? I actually did this presentation a couple weeks ago down in uh, California at the Troop, and I said, how many of you guys know who Larry Miller is? Nobody's hand went up. I'm like, anybody know who the Utah Jazz are? Yeah, they didn't know that. So anyway, yeah, here, thankfully, this makes resonates a little better. But was Larry Miller successful? Very. Anybody read his book? Yes. What did he say in his book about this area of his life? He failed miserably. He failed miserably in this area of his life. He was. We look at him and we say he was very successful here, but what kind of a father did he say he was? Or a husband. Or husband. Yeah. Now, thankfully, he did say later in life he did go and repair those and work on those pieces. But he didn't really be, he wasn't the type of father he, he later on wished that he would have been. So, oh, I was like, what? I'm like trying to figure out what. I thought it was my son back there playing music. And I'm like, oh. All right, so that, relationships. So in terms of your relationships. Now, let me ask you this. What killed Larry Miller? Diabetes not taking care of himself. His health is what killed him. So he was very successful here, but how how long did he get to live and enjoy that money? I mean, he was in his 60s, right, when he died. So he died somewhat fairly young, but he wasn't focused on these areas as much. He focused solely on this, and he was successful at it. But do you think he would change some things now? And he said, yes, he would, right? So let me give you one other example, Tiger Woods. What do, who's Tiger Woods? Golf player. Used to be a really good golfer. So say that again, Eric. Used to, really Used to be a really good golfer. So what? He uh, he was a really good golfer. What happened? What changed? Oh, isn't that interesting? He got messed up in this area of his life, yeah. and then what happened after that? His golf swing walked out on him. Well, before his golf swing walked out on him, what else happened? Started drinking. Sponsorships left. Well, yeah, but then he started having back problems. He's had he's been up to Park City to have surgeries and things. So can you see how these three things relate to each other? How Tiger Woods, who who arguably was going to be the best golfer, maybe still could be could be considered that, but he got screwed up in this in this area of his life, which then led to issues in his health, which now has affected the money area of his life as well. Can you see how these things are connected? So as we go through and we talk about these things, keep in mind as we talk about some of these things that there are three areas that you need to be working on in your life. And it's interesting that we, that we use this as the stool and we talk about balance, that you, know, you want to have balance in your life, which you're always going to be working on that. John Syed actually on the coaching call on Monday talked about that. You're constantly going to be working on getting balance in these three areas. But it is something you need to be constantly working on at all times, okay? Now, here's the other thing. What ultimately 
and I said this before, but this is not just about you being successful in real estate. It's about who you become and what you what you do and what you accomplish. Anyone know who Horace Mann is? Who is Horace Mann? Morris who? Horace Mann. Horace Mann. I don't know who he is. Who is he? Uh, he's a great. Uh, I don't know exactly Morris everything he did, but he founded uh, an insurance company and a very successful one. He used to uh, be part of the uh, teachers' education system. Yeah, so he was he was heavily involved basically with teachers, and he, he was an educator. In, in a lot of ways, he kind of was the founder of, of public school systems. Think of it that way. One of the things that he said as part of um, one of his famous quotes, and I'm not going to get it quoted exactly right, but essentially what he said is, it's a shame to live your life and not leave some type of a legacy. Now, I totally paraphrased that. But essentially he was saying, you should be leaving behind some type of a legacy behind, not just going through life and not ever doing anything. Now, for me personally, let me, I'm going to, I'll give you um, some personal on this. My dad, um, and I think I've mentioned this before, my dad was killed when I was seven. He was a pharmacist and uh, he was killed when I was seven years old. But right after that happened, they were building an elementary school and they named the school after my dad. Now, who, do, who typically gets schools named after them? Teachers, people what? People who gave land or money. Okay, gave land or money, which we didn't do. Who else? Presidents. Leaders. Presidents, Presidents leaders. Those. Yeah, so for me, that's kind of like, when when I think about, for me, like what kind of is, is the legacy I would want to leave behind, I still today, so it's been 40 years, today though, I still run into people that would say, oh, you were Doug Orchard's son? Oh, let me tell you about, you know, about him. So, to me, I want still people talking about me 40 years after I'm gone. Or no, and not that I'm saying I want to have a school named after me, but, but think about that. What kind of a legacy do you want to leave behind with, with your family, your kids, whatever it is, but you need to have those kind of things as your objective. Now, that's a good foundation or a, a good segue, probably I should say, to let's talk about our company foundation now. So I'm going to put it in terms of this pyramid here. Segue, please. I've heard the same segue. How are you using the word segue? What How? Do you mean? I'm just segueing from this to this. Transition. Like a tra transition. 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 Okay. I just want to know what the word meant. I mean, I've heard of a segue when it's a little thing you ride. <laughs> <laughs> How many master's degrees do you have, Brad? Like three? I'm joking. All right. Well, so I didn't learn everything. Oh, okay. Apparently not, right? Okay. So here's what we're going to talk about in terms of this. Okay. So. So in terms of the foundation, here's where we want to start with. So this is the footings piece of it, but we're going to go through the foundation, the company foundation, and, and how it applies to you. So the first place that we're going to start with here on this is, is our purpose, your why, dreams, sometimes people say vision, whatever, any of those things, okay? First thing that you have to understand for you is what is your purpose? What is your why? What is the dreams? What are the visions? And when I t when we talk about that, your purpose, your why, your dreams, vision, what what are we talking about? Motivation. Say more about that. Uh, you have to have a reason for doing things, and if you don't have a good reason, you won't do them, or you won't continue to do them. You have to take you somewhere you want to go. Okay, good. Yeah, so I love it. That's exactly right. Your purpose, your why, is, is for you to have kind of knowing why you're doing it. So, so if I were to go through and ask you why you were doing real estate, a, a lot of times people will just say, well, I want to make a lot of money. Well, it's got to be bigger than money or else you won't do it. That's the biggest thing I would say is if it's all about the money, you're not going to do it. So what do you want to do with the money? What is it about the money that's important to you? Now, stop and think about this for a minute. And, and we talk about this in the needs analysis class, but 10% of who you are as a personality is conscious. 90% is unconscious. So 90% of who you are is unconscious, meaning there's a lot of programming that's gone on that is under the surface that you are not aware of. Now, in terms of that, when we talk about the 90% of who, or excuse me, 10% of who you are is conscious, 90% is unconscious. The other piece of that is 10% of who you are is logical, the other 90% is what? Illogical. Illogical is what we would a lot of times think of, but it's emotional. Think of it as emotion. But yeah, you're, same concept. It's typically the 10% is logic, the 90% is emotional. So 
close your eyes for a minute and picture a guy that's 5'9", his name's Bob, he's 5'9", he weighs 400 pounds. What's the problem with Bob? He's too short, right? No. You guys missed the whole joke. <laughs> You're too serious, relax, right? So, yeah, picture him though. So picture in your mind for a minute. <laughs> what? That's a joke. Nothing. I know, apparently, yeah, he's too short. He weighs 400 pounds because he's too short. Not I know. It, yeah, the timing was bad or something. Okay. Anyway, picture him for a minute, though. How's he gonna move? Roll. Slow. Roll. 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 I like the penguin. Penguin. Yeah. So, what about getting on a plane? He's sitting, right. he's sitting in the middle seat next to me. <laughs> yeah, on Southwest, he's in the middle, right? So, um, why does he do that? But stop and think about it for a minute. What is the, when he goes, Bob goes to the doctor, what does the doctor tell him? So, yeah, they tell, the doctor tells him, you need to lose weight, you've got to cut back. Why does he not do it? Because he's too short. He can't grow. His wife's not big enough. Okay, good. So, Tony said his why is not big enough. Let's hear what why has to say. Uh, I was just going to say he just doesn't have a future, future vision of anything. I mean, I, if they told him, hey, you're going to die in three months, you know, because you're, then his situation would change because life is going to be over, but at that point he has no purpose. Actually, interesting on that, um, there was a study done. This was actually, and I don't know why this was in Consumer Reports, but this was in a Consumer Reports magazine thing, this that, that talked about, interesting that, did you realize, probably 90% of the people who, if they go to the doctor and the doctor said to them, you're gonna die in six months if you don't change this habit, do you know, well, I think I already gave 90%. you the number. Yeah, sorry. Out of 100 people, I gave you the number. Out of 100 people, how many would change? 10%. Yeah, it's 10. Only 10% of the people who, if you were told, so all, think about within here of us, there's probably 20 of us in here. If, if we were to go to the doctor, all of us, and we were all told, if you do not fundamentally change this thing about you, you're gonna die in the next six months, only 10% of us would change. Only two. Two. And it wouldn't be me. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, it would be Tanner though, right? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, we don't change. So why do we not change? It's hard. Why is not big enough? Yeah, it's hard. And, and again, it's back to 10% of who we are is conscious, 90% is unconscious. Think of it this way. There is a lot of programming that has gone on in you that is under the surface that controls you. Think of it that way. That controls you more than you are consciously aware about, of. Meaning, nobody wakes up in the morning thinking to themselves, I'm going to just go out and see what I can do to screw up my day today, right? No, did anybody wake up thinking that? So why does it happen? See, the reason it happens is because we have practiced these things. We have practiced, we have unconscious behaviors that we have practiced, we've habitualized. That it's become a habit for us. So how do we break out of those things? Well, I'm going to give you a number of ideas on it, but part of part of it is tied to understanding the why. Why do you want to be successful in real estate? What is it about it that is is driving you? And it can't be the money. So let's say that you get the money. Then what? What are you going to do with it? And if you haven't written these things down, you need to have it written down somewhere. Of why do I want to be successful? What is it about it? Because otherwise what happens is as soon as you start to make some money, then you back off because you get complacent. You get comfortable with, oh, it's more than I've had and it's sufficient to, to get me by. But no, if you understand kind of this greater and bigger picture, you've got to have that in place. Now, here's the other thing. When we talk about logic and emotion, does logic tell you to go get on the phone and talk to a stranger? No, we're taught not to. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to say, what were you taught as a kid? Don't, don't, talk, talk, don't talk to strangers. Yet now you have come into the business that what is your responsibility? To, talk to, to go and talk to strangers. Now, so do you have any idea? Remember I said 90% of you is unconscious. It's this programming that's gone on. You've been taught your whole life growing up, don't talk to strangers, don't talk to strangers. And why were you not supposed to talk to strangers? To teach your 
Yeah, they're going to hurt you. They're dangerous, right? They might kidnap you. And now you come into the business that, you, that what we're telling you is you've got to go talk to people that are strangers, but your whole life, all the programming that went on told you don't talk to strangers. Now you know the source of the anxiety or whatever in terms of prospecting is you were taught your whole life don't talk to strangers. They're not safe. They're going to hurt you, right? So that's, that's the emotional piece. See, go ahead. It's working on the other end, too, for who we're talking to. Oh, being they're afraid of you, too? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, they're, yeah, their objective is to get away from you, right? It's the same kind of a thing. Okay, so we have to understand this. If you understand this, and, and if you have identified that. Now, here's the next piece. Once you've identified these things, you need to be sharing that with somebody. A broker or somebody that you can say, this is what I want to accomplish. I need you to hold me accountable so that I can accomplish these things, whatever your why is. You've got to understand that. If you've got that in place, you are when, when the logic says don't prospect, you'll then maybe say, oh, but this is more important to me. Comment there? Yeah, I think I would like to say, I, um, John Syed and I worked together on, on some projects early on before the company ever started. And then one of the things that I appreciated was that uh, when they, he asked me if I would, if I would come here, and, I, and, I, and I, I did, I was one of the first few. But one of the things that I appreciated most about, about is when they told me what the business model is going to be, and they even, they almost prophesied that someone like Russ Orchard would be here because they wanted to make sure that people were always surrounded by the right people. Um, but when he, I, I wondered if they would really do this. I wondered if, 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 if it, because it, this is a lot to do every day and, then, and to, um, but Paul Harvey said that if you have a good message, don't change the message, just change the alignments. Yeah. If the message doesn't change, it's good. Um, so I wondered if they would be able to keep doing this. And I, I even mentioned that early on when there were five or six in a room. And now there's so many. And their message never changed. Their, their intention and what they knew would work in this industry has never changed and it's only grown. I, what I loved about the real estate business in general was that it, it's one of the best opportunities for us to expose our weaknesses. Every time we're in a situation, and what I learned early on is that I really appreciated the fact that when something didn't work out that I knew, I knew had good intentions and that, that it should, I knew that it just exposed some type of weakness that I had. Sometimes many of them. And I recognized also that the faster I could expose those weaknesses, the faster I could grow from them, and the less often they would show up. So I really wanted that to happen more and more often. And so every time one showed up, I was really excited about it. Because I said, there is a weakness. And then I knew what to go work on that day and the next day and from then on. So I was really excited about that. And, and now if there was anything I would do, I would verify that everything that Russ is saying is absolutely true, and that's why they're successful. Second, is if you can expose yourself to your weaknesses faster and more often, and be grateful that they showed up and fix them, you'll get where you're going so much faster. Cool. Yeah, thanks. So, which for those that don't know, Daryl has been with the company since very early on, right? So, so he knows what he's talking about in terms of the... Uh, um, the company and what ha the growth and things have taken it's, place. It's real. It, this yeah. is genuinely what they believe, and it's never going to change. Yeah, correct. Shane. Basically, everything that you just said was in the Tuesday tip today, so if you guys haven't read it, I'm sure. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't read it yet, so that's awesome. Well, good. So, so here's the question with this. How long does it take to, to make a Rolls Royce? Anybody know? How long does it take to build a Rolls Royce? They make like 400 a year or something, four or five. Yeah, I don't know how many. That's a great question. I don't know, but not many. They don't make many. Eight hours. Eight hours? I don't know, one a day for a year. Six months, actually, is about. So that's just your standard Rolls Royce. It takes six months to create. How long does it take to create to make a uh, Toyota Corolla? Closer to what you said. Thirteen hours, right? So. Essentially, they're the same thing, right? 
a Toyota Corolla and a Rolls Royce, aren't they essentially the same thing? Yeah, they are going to get you from point A to point B, right? So what's the difference between, why would somebody pay so much for a Rolls Royce and Quality. not that much for a Toyota Corolla? Quality. One's a McDonald's cheeseburger, the other one's a filet mignon. Because Rolls Royce generally are audience. They choose their audience. Okay, good. Yeah, everything you guys are saying is exactly right on. So essentially, it takes time to create something very good, right? Go ahead. Well, I don't know. I've been struggling with this, but I think you just help with that. It's your image. What image do you use? One, a Toyota image or a Rolls Royce image? Not that that the best, but the idea is there. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. Excellent. Good. Yeah, so here's the other piece of it. Think of it this way. Part of why we want you to have this why, why we want you to understand your purpose, your vision, your dreams, all of those things, is because clarity is power. When you are clear as to what it is you want to do, it will then get you to go counter to what your emotions tell you to do, which is, again, logic tells you don't go get on the phone and call people. But if you understand this and you're clear as to it, it will then motivate you to go out and do those things so that you can accomplish the things that you have as your objectives. Okay? So good. So next, in our foundation, the next piece of this. Is goals, plan, and schedule. Okay? So goals, plan, and schedule. So now that we understand. So... Uh, Please make sure that you leave here today, if you have never done this, to stop and figure out what your why is. Now, I'll actually even give you, uh, before I jump into goals, let me give you actually an exercise that I did that I would recommend that you guys do and take some time to do this, is to, it, to just sit down and really just, where there's no distractions, and just start to write about, ask yourself the question of, of what is it? What is my purpose? What is my ultimate purpose in life? What, or what is the why? What is it that I want to accomplish? And then start writing down every single thing that comes to your head. Anything. Doesn't matter what it is. If you think this is stupid, write down this is stupid while you're thinking, while you're doing it, okay? Seriously, write down every single thing that comes to your head. But, and the reason for that is if you will take the time to do that, to, to ask the question, what is it? What is it that I want to accomplish? What is it I want to leave behind? And then just start writing down every single thing that pops into your head. Even if it is, this is stupid, or I want to have a beach house. I mean, whatever it is that comes to your head, even if what comes to your head is, I don't have time to be doing this, write it down and continue to just write it down. And here's what I'll tell you. I don't know how long it will take for you, but if you will do that, it may be a half an hour, it might be two hours but you will come to something that you will write down that you will then feel it. And when you feel that is when you're gonna know, okay, that's what my purpose, that's my why that you're gonna work towards. Does that make sense? Go with an open mind, small, little, anything. Anything, I don't care what, it, like I said, if, if what comes to your mind is this is stupid, Russ is stupid, I don't care, whatever it is, write it down, okay? okay. All right, now, now that we have that in place, then based on that is the next section, which is the goals, plan, and schedule. Now, we'll, we'll talk more about this in the business planning class, but Robert Kiyosaki, the guy that wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he talks about the cash flow quadrant. What are the four quadrants that he talks about? How many of you read the book? Only a few. Oh, you guys need to read it. So, what, so the, the cash flow quadrant, there's four quadrants. What are they? Employees. Okay, employees, the first one, which is what most people end up being. Employee, self-employed, uh, business owner, and investor. Good, yes. So you've got employee up at the top here. Down underneath that is a self-employed. Up over here is business owner and then investor. So part of what we want you to do is most people will come into this real estate business and approach it from the standpoint of they're obviously not an employee, right? They came into this because they wanted to be self-employed. Under self-employed, what happens if a self-employed person doesn't work? They're hungry. They don't make money. Yeah, if it, it's all on you, right? So if you don't f show up and do your job, then you don't get paid. What about a business owner? What happens with a business owner? They make money whether they show up or not, right? If not, they should, anyway. If he structure the business and runs it as a business owner, not as an employee, then yes, he can have 
income without having to be there every hour of the day. Okay, good. Yeah, so let me ask you a question. And this is more of the point. And like I said, we'll get more into this in the business planning class. But a what's the difference between a business owner and a self-employed person? And, and what I mean by that is not just meaning the self-employed is all by themselves, but Shannon? A self-employed person could be a subcontractor for somebody else, therefore still an employee. A business owner has something invested. Okay, so when you say something invested, tell me more what you Time, mean. Time, money. Okay, good. That's what all of the about. Okay, good. So on the other hand, Eric? I was just going to say that the business owners figured out the process and what they need to do to be the business owner. The self-employed person just has an idea and wants to be the business owner. Okay, good. What else What else does a business owner have? He has systems in place that um, work when he's not working. Good. That's where, that's where I wanted to go with it is they've got systems that are set up. They've got, if you were going to go open a hamburger place and somebody brought up, I think, McDonald's, did you say that? So are you more successful to just go open a hamburger joint or are you going to be more successful if you open up a McDonald's? Probably a McDonald's. Probably a McDonald's. Why? Because they they've got the systems, they got the plan. All right, now picture this. Picture for a minute that that um, you're sitting in a board meeting. Okay, so let's say that you guys are all on the board of directors for uh, Apple. Okay, and in walks who's the guy that's the, I don't even know who the president is now or CEO of Apple. Who is it? Tim somebody. Tim, Tim Cook. Yeah. Tim Cook. Yeah. Tim Cook walks into the meeting. Okay, so you guys are the board. I'm Tim Cook. Okay. I come into the meeting and I say, all right, guys, we've been very successful here at Apple. Would you guys agree? Yes. Has Apple been a little bit successful? We created the iPod, the iPhone. We've created the iPad. Look at all these things we've done. And Eyeglasses. We're working on those. <laughs> we're going to call them the iPatch. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we've created all these great things. I want to take a new approach. We're, we're kind of on the cutting edge, or at least we used to be, but we're not so much anymore. People have kind of caught up to us. And you know, in the past, we've always had like a business plan of what we were going to do. We're going to throw that all out. We're just going to go show up and see what happens. That's our plan for this year. We're not going to actually have a plan. We're just going to show up and see what happens. What's going to happen to me as Tim Cook if you're the board? And I showed up and said, we're not really going to have a plan this year. I, I don't budget. Eh, we're not worried about that. We'll probably have a special meeting when you're not there. And to do what? Fire you. Fire yeah, you, you, everybody is in agreement, right? You would fire me if I showed up and did that. Yes, pretty much. Yet, how many of us in real estate come in and say, OK, I have a goal of I want to make $100,000 this year. And which is, by the way, the most common goal that people have is to make $100,000. So I have a goal to make $100,000. So what's your plan to get there? Well, I don't have one. I'm going to wing it. I'm going to wing it, <laughs> right? That's what we tend to do. So do you understand the importance of we got to have goals, but then once we have the goal, what's your plan to get there? Do you have a plan of what that needs to look like? And then last of that, now that we have our plan, what's your schedule going to look like? Do each of you, and don't answer this, but do you have an actual schedule written out for this is what my schedule looks like for real estate? This is the days that I plan to be at Morning Ascent. Here's the days that I'm going to role play. Here's when I'm going to role play. Who's who, here's who I'm going to role play with. Do you have all those things written down and put in place? Because if you don't, then go back to our cash flow quadrant. You're moving yourself from being a business owner to the self-employed. I had a guy that I worked for right out of high school. In fact, I was still in high school working for this guy doing construction. And he was really just a self-employed person. And here it is now, however many years later from when I graduated, I guess like a lot. Anyway, I don't know what I want to say. A lot of years later, and he's barely still just limping along in his business. Here's what I will tell you about real estate agents in my experience is if you don't follow this and have a goal with some plans and a schedule that you're going to follow, you will be the same as that guy. You'll do fine in real estate, but you're never going to kind of get to where you want to be, which is what your purpose, your why, your dreams are. So make sure you have those things written down. Come up with them. Here's my goals, plan, schedule. All right. Have I beat that one up enough? Can I add to that? Yes. 
those of you who are married or in relationships and stuff too, make sure that your plan, your goal, your schedule, your purpose, your dream, your vision is in harmony with your spouse. Yes, That's important thank you. that they're in harmony with one another or it will become very contentious. So, And those that are, don't have one, go find a spouse. I pointed to myself. Go find a spouse, right? <laughs> but yes, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, once you have these goals, the plan and the schedule, yeah, you do need to share that with somebody and, and, and many people, really, and even share it with the people around you here at work of, hey, here's what my schedule looks like. If you see me off my schedule, then let me know. Get me back on track, okay? So thank you for sharing that. All right, next. Next thing in our foundation here. is mindset. This is one area actually that is kind of surprising that doesn't get dealt with much in real estate is talking about the, the mindset that people have. Why is your mindset important? Does anything that your brain is thinking, your, you will ultimately make it true. So like if you're telling yourself, I can't do this, you, know, you probably won't. Good, good, excellent. Why? I think this is an uh, it could be an emotionally draining career if you don't have the right mindset. You know, you, you definitely got to have a mindset of a warrior, of a go-getter, of experiencing both good and bad moments. You know, and if, if you're not if you're not willing to go through that, it's you're gonna bury yourself. You know, you're gonna you're gonna go through some traumas faster than what a warrior would go through. Okay, good, excellent, love it, Brad. If, for me, I look at it and I say, well, if I don't work on my mindset, which to me is the logical part of working on the mindset, then 90% is going to undermine everything I want to do. Okay. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Yes. Everything you guys have said is right on. So mindset is so crucial. In fact, as Cheyenne was saying that this morning, I listened to uh, Earl Nightingale has a, an audio recording that you guys can get this. It's like, I don't know, three bucks or something. But it's called The Strangest Secret. In this, in this recording of The Strangest Secret, what he talks about in there is the secret to success. And, and in fact, he said almost everybody, if you look back, all the philosophers, all of them, when they discovered this, they thought they were the first person to figure this out. But what you think about all day long is who you will become or what you will achieve. So this, The Strangest Secret in that and what he talks about is how you become successful is what you think about. It's what you stop and you think about. So in terms of mindset, the reason that we have Morning Ascent here every single day is because we need to work on the mindset. This is a very negative business. You get told no a lot, right? You get told no a lot and that can wear on you. And so the, the only way to overcome that is through the mindset. So that's why we do so many trainings and things is to try to help the mindset for you. And again, back to part of why we want you focused on this why. If you really are clear on where you're going, where you're headed to, you're not as worried when somebody tells you no because that's just, hey, that, I don't have to worry about that person. I can get on to the next, right? So in terms of mindset, there are a number of things that you need to be looking at and paying attention to in terms of mindset. First thing that I would say on that is, what are you watching? So pay attention to the things that you're watching. What are you watching? Meaning, TV is, the TV is a great tool, but it's a tool to be used for you for good. Meaning, if you're just sitting there watching, I don't know, The Bachelor or Bachelorette or whatever one is on right now, like is that a good use of, of that tool? No. Now, be sure that you, be, Make sure that you're using it to help get you get your mindset where it needs to be. Two is reading. Are you taking time every day to, to set some time aside to be reading something? Are you reading books? One of the things that, that you will hear said again over and over again in this company is leaders are readers. And your number one job that you have as an agent is to be a leader. Really, that's the thing that is going to set you apart from everybody else is to be a leader. Well, leaders are readers. So if you are wanting to be a leader, you've got to be a reader. You've got to be spending time reading things. Now, when I'm saying reading things, reading things that are going to help the mindset, things that are going to help you become better and to become more, okay? Number three, listening. What are you listening to? 
Are you jumping in the car and just use and listening to the radio or plugging in your iPhone or your iPod or whatever and just listening to, to music? Um, I think it was Zig Ziglar that said, with the amount of time that we spend in a car, if we would actually just sit and listen to educational things, that you could actually earn a, a master's or a doctorate degree just by driving around in the car. So when you're in the car, what are you listening to? Are you listening to things that are improving and building your mindset? So don't, don't just plug in and just go mindless on, on the radio or music, but plug in some of these things. I just talked to you about the strangest secret that Earl Nightingale has. I mean, like I said, it's like three bucks you can get it off Audible or, or the iTunes for like three bucks. You'll find them on YouTube for free. Yeah, that's true. You probably get it on YouTube for free. That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, YouTube or for free. Audio, audio, audio. Yeah, but so get some of those things and then listen to them over and over and over again and, and be paying attention to those things. Okay, next. Did you call it the four wheel university? Yeah, I think that you're right. I think that's what it was, the four wheel university. All right, next. Who are you associating with? Who are the people you're spending time with? If you're spending time with people that are talking negative and bringing you down, then you need to probably move on from that. Darren Hardy, which Darren Hardy was the editor of uh, Success Magazine. He's not anymore, but he, he kind of wanted to become like uh, Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill, um, which we quote every morning, this success formula or self-confidence formula over here. Napoleon Hill is the one who wrote Think and Grow Rich. Well, Darren Hardy kind of decided he wanted to become kind of like the next Napoleon Hill. And so he, he was the editor of this success magazine. And what he was doing was going out and trying to interview all these successful people with the idea being of what can I learn from them about being successful. Well, one of the things that he talks about on this associate is pay attention to who you're associating with. The people you're associating with really will fall into one of three categories. One being people that you should spend zero time with or less time with. So look at the people that you associate with. Who are the ones that you should not be spending so much time with? Now, for some of you, you may find that it's a family member or something that you're saying, okay, that doesn't mean we don't spend time with them. We just control how much time we're spending with them. Number two is the people that are, hey, it's good. It's good that I associate with them and I keep doing that. And then the third one is the people you should increase your association with. Going out and finding. It has been said that you are the average of the, the five people you spend the most time with, you are, the, you are the average of those five people. So if you want to increase who you are, your average, what do you do? Increase who you spend time with. Yeah, change who you're spending time with. So look at some of the agents in the office that you would say, that's the type of an agent I want to be, and then go ask them, hey, can I take you to lunch sometime and ask you some questions? Go take them to lunch. Find people that are outside of real estate that are successful people that you can figure out a way to start associating with. Because the people that you associate with are going to determine who you are and how, how you become. They're also going to have a big role in controlling the mindset of how you are thinking about yourself and about the business and all those things. Make sense? Any thoughts or questions, comments on mindset? Okay, why well, is ready for the next one then? All right, so the next is going to be discipline slash accountability. What's the difference between discipline and accountability? Eric? One requires yourself, the other requires others. Perfect. Yeah, that's the way I would say to think about this. Is discipline is is what I'm able to do, just holding myself to do it. Accountability is is ex external. So discipline is internal. Accountability is going to be external. So in terms of discipline and accountability. So now that we've got these goals, plans, and schedule, one of the things we talked about is going and sharing it with people. Right? We want to share it with them. Part of why we're sharing it with them is under this accountability piece to be able to say, okay. If I said, Tanner, if you see me ever not on my schedule, then, you know, you can punch me or whatever. I mean, whatever you want to do, you know, but, but have them, hey, if you see me not on my schedule, Tony, I need you to come up and say, hey, 
what, what are you doing? I thought you wanted to own that beach house in Hawaii or whatever. And just, it, you know, if you're not prospecting today, are you going to be able to get that? I mean, if Tony comes and says that to me and that's what I'm wanting, I'm going to go, yeah, you're right, Tony, thanks. I'm going to get back on it, right? So in terms of that, the discipline is holding yourself to do it. Accountability is having the outside forces. So one of the things that we recommend that you do is set, have an accountability partner. Have somebody that you have as an accountability partner that I can say, okay, Matt, if I don't prospect every single day this week, I'll pay you $500. Okay? What? Oh, shoot. Yeah. Well, so, and for you, it just, you got to decide what does that need to be in order that it's going to make these, which is going to be more painful, the prospecting or paying $500 to Maddie? And, and for you, if, if $500 is not that painful, up it to 1000 or 5000 whatever it is, but come up with something. I mean, some people have done all eat cat food or whatever, so it doesn't matter what it is, but figure out for you what will be so uncomfortable that you'll go and do whatever your accountability is? is. Make sense? You guys don't seem like you're very excited about that one. <laughs> I don't get it. So, yeah, so making sure that we have this discipline and accountability. Accountability actually is a privilege. If you stop and think about it, accountability really is a privilege. And, and why I say that is we've got Mike Ferry that's going to be here for our summit on June 29th. One of the things that he's going to do, actually, at this meeting, just so you guys know, is he's going to actually try to convince you to then go participate in the Superstar Retreat in Vegas on July 31st through August 4th, which I would highly recommend doing if you can get there to go and do that. But at the Superstar Retreat, he's going to try to sell you on coaching, which essentially coaching is somebody that you're going to pay to hold you accountable. Anybody know how much agents spend to have someone hold them accountable through that? Uh, typically, through that program, it's a thousand bucks a month with a 12 month contract. So, $12,000 a year, people will pay to have somebody hold them accountable. Account Does that tell you anything about how important accountability is? People will pay a thousand dollars a month to have somebody hold them accountable. Now, good news is for you guys, Century 21 globally will participate in that and Century 21 Everest will participate in that, so it reduces the cost if you want to do that. But still, the point being, accountability is a privilege, not a bad thing. So don't think it as a bad thing. Meaning, if I go to lunch today and I go, since we're talking McDonald's, and I go to McDonald's and I go in and I order five Big Macs, is the person behind the counter going to hold me accountable? Are they going to say, are you sure you want to eat those five Big Macs? They're not, right? They're just there, they'll just do it. So accountability is a privilege. So think of it that way in terms of that. Now, it, uh, here's the other thing on accountability. Of all the weight loss programs that are out there, which one is the number one? Weight Watchers. Yeah, it is, Weight Watchers. And why do you think Weight Watchers is the number one, meaning most successful weight loss program that's out there? Why would Weight Watchers be number one? Accountability. They have there's accountability, right? Is that what you were going to say, Jim? So, yeah, you have to weigh in. You have to show up and get on the scale every single week. Now, when you go get on the scale, does the scale justify? You had a rough week this week. It's okay. <laughs> no. It tells the truth, right? So think of accountability as the same thing. For you to be successful in the business, the same thing. You need to either hire somebody to be a coach through Mike Ferry or get somebody to be an accountability partner that you can weekly sit down and say, okay, hey, here's what I'm going to do this week. If I don't do it, here's what the consequence will be. And you just decide for you, what does that need to be? What is going to be mo more painful than not doing it? Does that make sense? All right, next. Next one is skill set. So in terms of skill set, here's what's interesting to me. So we started this whole discussion of what's the difference between us here at Century 21 Everest and other companies and what is it about us that makes us successful. Most companies will focus on skill sets with their agents. But look at how much stuff we have talked about prior to even getting to the skill set. All these other pieces. That's what really st has us stand out from that. Now, with that said, in terms of skill set, 
there are 12 skills that you need to be working on as you grow your business. So let's make a list of those 12 skills, these 12 skill sets. Now, but before we get into those 12 skills that you need to master, and I mentioned this before, but what I, I want to really reinforce it and see if you got it. What, what is your job in real estate? Now, don't, don't go to what we did last week on Thursday, the final Jeopardy question. That's not what I'm asking. But what really is your job? It, sum it up in one word. Okay, good, thank you, Tanner. Yeah, it's to lead. Your job really in this business is to be a leader, is to lead people through the process, right, of getting their home sold or them buying a new house. Your job is to lead. What is the number one skill that you need to acquire as a leader? Communication. Perfect, yes, yeah, say it again. Communication. Yeah, the number one skill you need to be working on is communication. Now, I have been here at Everest now for only two years. So, in fact, just this week, was my uh, two-year anniversary with Everest, okay? I have heard that said for two years of, your job is to be a leader, number one skill you can acquire is communication. For two years I've heard that, and I feel like I might be starting to understand what that means. So, the fact that you have probably heard it as well, I would w wager that you don't get it. Because I feel like I'm starting to get it now. After two years of me being at Morning Ascent, essentially, every day that I'm in town, I'm here. So, two years of me being here and listening to it over and over and over and over and over again, and I hear people saying all the time, oh yeah, well George just says the same thing, it's the same message all the time over and over again. Okay, good, but I sat, I've sat here for two years and heard these same messages over and over and over again, and I think I'm starting to understand. I heard George say one time, it takes about three years of being here before you really get it. So even though you might think you get it, I'm here to tell you, you don't get it. You need to keep showing, and part of why I say that is because if you're not doing it, you don't get it, okay? So as we talk about these different skill sets, You've got to be constantly working on them. And really, at the end of the day, as, we, as I give you these 12 skill sets, at the end of the day, really, they're all about one thing. And that is the communication. communication. Right? It's all about becoming a better communicator. Really diving in and, and learning how to be a better communicator. All right. So let's go through. And I'm going to see how you guys can do on this. So I'm... It doesn't have to be in order, but let's kind of try to go in order in terms of these skill sets. What do you think the skill sets you need to acquire are? So like what's the first, think of it as up here is communication and then we're going to hit on these 12 subcategories there. So in terms of your job and things. Knowing what to say. For what, okay good, why? Are, any, are these the 12 steps to submit a success? No, that's separate. That's separate. So no, so okay good. I want a different word for it, but you're on the right track. We follow up. Scripts. So. I know. I know one of them, but I'm trying not to say the one I know. Scripts. Oh, well, <laughs> why not say the one you know? Presentations. Okay. Because it's like way down there on the bottom of the Okay, so before lead follow-up, well, maybe part of lead. Lead follow-up would be contained in it, and scripts would be contained in it. For what? What are we doing it for? Prospect prospect. For what reason? You're right. For what reason? Selling. Contracts. Thank you. Setting, Setting mm. appointments. It's setting appointments two T's or? Yes. You know what I need up here actually? I need this board to be smart so that like if I spell it wrong it goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> then I'd be like, oh okay, yeah, I spell it wrong. Alright. Setting appointments. Okay, good. What else? Well, so I'll, I'll just kind of throw down some, some of these here. So you said presenting, right? Okay, good. What else? Shane? Time management. Okay, good. That's going to be one of them, absolutely. Objection handling. I need to look at my notes. I think, yeah, actually, lead follow-up. I was thinking that one was. So that is a separate one. It's a good job. 
Although in, in my mind, I think lead follow-up really kind of still falls under this setting because the whole purpose of lead follow-up is to get an appointment, right? Okay, what else? I thought I heard one other one. Objection handle? Oh yeah, that's one. Okay, good, what else? Prospecting one? Well, prospecting I would say is gonna be these. It's setting appointments, lead follow-up really. What else do we have to do? Think through the process of, of, of going through this. So, meaning we're, we're calling and prospecting and doing lead follow-up to set appointments. Research. We're setting the appointments then to, so research is, you're on the right track. It's not, I would call it something a little different though, we'll see. This would actually, I would guess, we could probably sit here all day and you'll never get it because most of you don't do it, so. Pre-qualify. So the research, I would say that's, I would put that in as part of it. Are you smiling because you don't do it? Right. <laughs> but pre-qualifying people. Okay, good. What else? It's closing all of them? Yeah. Absolutely. That one's a big skill that we need to work on. What else? Rating contract. Negotiating. That's going to say, let's call it negotiating and I'll give it to you. Negotiating contracts. Okay, what else? Let me see if we're missing any here. Well, we're missing some of them. I just want to see. Yeah, so far, so good. These are going to be a little bit harder, so I'll probably have Overseeing the transaction. Overseeing the transaction? Yes. We'll call it something different though. Customer service. What else? One of them just uh, like being knowledgeable of what you're doing. Like making sure you see you know what you're doing if you don't have any. Um I would kind of say maybe that's somewhat kind of contained within all of it, I don't know. Well, like learning, learning reading, or something else. Referrals? No, oh, I'm going to have to help you out. Next one is going to be, one of, one of the skills is going to be working with buyers, with highly qualified buyers. Oh, what? You were going to say that? I thought it was too easy. Were you working with sellers? <laughs> nope. Actually, well, yes, it is, but we're going to call it something else. That's which really in this market we don't need too much but price reductions so one of the skills we don't talk a lot about it right now in any of the trainings that we're doing because it's not as crucial in today's world but it is price reductions but here's what i'll tell you as our inventory starts to climb this is going to be a skill that you want to have is is how to get price reductions from from your sellers so all right isn't um, that something that we would, one one? Um, yeah that we would talk to about? Like when we when we take a listing. Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. All right. Let me see what I'm forgetting here. One more. Oh, I know what it is. It's related to this one. So it's back to kind of it's just pricing in general. Okay. So just so that's where kind of when you guys are saying knowledge and things is pricing. So the, these are 12 skills that here's what I would like you to do real quick. So, and, and you can hide it from people or whatever. But just quickly, on your list, if you've written this down, what I want you to do is to go through and rate yourself on each one of these skills from one to 10. So on a, and you're, you don't, you're not gonna share it with me, but this is just for you to have. Rate yourself on, on a scale of one to 10, how good are you at these 12 things? And part of what I want you to do is in rating yourself on that is that's then going to give you the opportunity to look at how am I doing on each of these areas, which ones do I need to work on, and then back to this goals plan and schedule is kind of put a plan in place of like what do you need to do to get better with it. And if you don't know, find somebody that you can talk to that you can ask a question of like what would you say to get better at this or that. Now here's the other thing that I will tell you. As part of it, I, 
I would guess at, the, at our summit on the 29th, Mike Ferry is going to go through and talk about a bunch of these different skills. I don't really know what he's going to talk about. I've just heard him enough times that he's going to talk about a bunch of those different skills and give you really some ideas of how to get better at a lot of these different skill sets. So he actually has what he calls, I think it, it, it's the 21 point system. It used When I first started, it was an 18 point system, but it's now up to, I think, 21 point system that he goes through, which is going to be contained in all of this stuff. But rate yourself on those and then decide, okay, which ones do I need to get better at and, and what do I need to do to get better at it? Does that make sense? Okay, any other questions? Anything on skill set? Let me do that my notes see if anything oh I left out one key piece I gotta go back to mindset for a second here's the thing I, I meant to sum this up on the mindset piece um, here's how crucial mindset is okay this is why mindset is so important there was a guy uh, in 2009 well he died in 2009 prior to 2009 in Germany, it's a guy by the name of Adolf Merkel. Anybody heard of Adolf Merkel? Yeah. Uh, you have? Really? What do you know about him? Uh, lots of, I don't remember what I've heard of him. Okay, good. So, what's the name? Adolf Merkel. So, he was a billionaire. That may be where you had heard the name before. Is he was a billionaire. In 2007, he had over $12 billion. Okay? 2007, he's got over $12 billion. He actually, he, he was born into a wealthy family, but he took his grandfather's business and created this pharmaceutical company that was hugely successful. So most of his money, even though he came from a wealthy family, that kind of gave him his launching pad to become like ultra wealthy. So he's got over $12 billion, and I think if I remember, it was like $12.8 billion that this guy had in 2007. In 2008, he decided to make a risky bet in, in some respects. I mean, it was, it was, he was investing really, but it was kind of, he was betting against Volkswagen. So he's betting that Volkswagen stock was going to go way down in value. So he, he basically bet against them, essentially, is what he did. Is he, he, he made some investments that if Volkswagen went down, he would make a ton of money on it, okay? So the problem is Porsche stepped in and gave them some help, and instead of their stock dropping, it shot up. Now, so if he was betting that it was going to go down and it goes up, what happens? He's a double loser. Yeah, he loses big time because the stock actually went up when he was basically betting on it going down. So he, his, this investment went into the, into the hundreds of millions of dollars and may even have been into a billion dollars. And then he, because of that, ended up having some bad decisions business-wise. So by the end of 2008, now keep in mind, what we're talking about is mindset here, okay? In 2007, he's got over $12 billion. At the end of 2008, December of 2008, his net worth has gone from $12 billion down to $9 billion. So he's lost how much? Yeah, three billion dollars. But how much does he still have? Nine. Yeah, but how are you going to get by on that? I know. Well, I know. That, I wondered the same thing. Like, how are you going to survive with nine billion dollars, right? Well, he wondered the same thing. In January of 2009, he throws himself in front of a train. That's where. That's what you remembered it from. Yeah. He commits suicide. He throws himself in front of a train because why would he do that? He associated the money with success. Yet he still had nine billion dollars. Like the rest of us would think you would still be happy with the money, right? Yeah. But he throws himself in front of a train because his, he, he, his mindset, his success was tied to his money and because he had lost three billion dollars, he figured why. Had Porsche built the train? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well, uh, back to the three-legged stool, I guess it wasn't balanced. Correct. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. The relationship could have helped him. His help could have helped him. He was only in the money. Yeah, that's all he was worried about was this area. And when it, when he lost $3 billion, he figured life's over. 
But he still had knives. Like, do you get it? I mean, maybe he felt depressed because it affected other people. His self worth was tied to his money. Yeah. And we can't do that, which is why we've got to have this bigger, bigger purpose. Okay. All right. So skill set. Any other questions, comments, thoughts on the skill set? So what were to take on that last little part of the mindset? You don't have. You can't be. T it can't be about the money, because if it's about the money and the money goes away, then what happens? You have nothing. Yeah, you feel like I got nothing, and and so yeah, it can't be about the money. It's got to be again back to. The whole mission of this company is to help you become your very best. And if you do that, the money can come and go and you'll be just fine. Okay? All right. So the last piece then here is going to be strategies. Oops, I'm spelling it wrong again, but tools, systems, all of those things, okay? So now that we've got all these things in place, now we can worry about our strategies, tools, and systems. Too many times agents want to work in like almost reverse order of, okay, I got to get the strategies. What's, what is the systems I'm going to use? What are the tools and things? When instead, we need to be instead saying, you'll, those pieces you'll figure out. I promise you, you'll figure that out. Worry about it in this other order, going this way. Work on your skill sets before you worry about the strategies and systems. Without any deals, you don't need any strategies or systems, right? You don't need the system. So now we still are going to work on them with you, but ultimately this is the foundation of the company is, is for us is most important is again, back to who you become. It's helping you become your very best. If you become your very best, all the rest of these things are going to fall into place. So another way of saying is you need to be working harder on yourself than you are on your job. You need to be working harder on you becoming who you need to become. Now, part of that becoming is through this communication. I tell you, I have been in the business 21 years, and prior to coming here, I don't think I ever heard anybody say, your success in this business is going to really boil down to how effective you are as a communicator. I mean, have you ever heard anybody say it that way? No. And I would ask Daryl, but he's been here so long that yes, well, he has. There are so many other organizations, and they all mean well, except they just don't have an understanding of how valuable this foundation is for somebody to be successful, and that's why there's so many people that fail. It's not because they wanted to. They just didn't know how to make it. Yeah, I'd say that's exactly right. Yeah, excellent. All right, so in terms of systems, tools, and strategies, we've got all of those pieces. That, that we can help you with. We'll do classes on all those things, so you'll get all those things. But um, any questions, thoughts, comments on this? I have a question. Uh, yeah. You started out with three things that were foundational, and the first one was was being coachable. Oops. What are the other two? Oh, I, no, I think what I was referring to is this. If I if I said it that way, I probably said it wrong. Oh, you did. I just said the number one thing we're asked. I probably did say these three things. No, you weren't talking about that yet. It was when you very first started. You said that there's three things that George said are really important. The first one is being coachable. Oh, yeah, I respond. Yeah, I did the same thing, yeah. Oh. Focus on you need to be, be coachable, coachable, be healthy, be what I've got. So I've got two of them. Be, ho be coachable, I don't know. be healthy. I don't know why I said that. Be focused. That's what I've got. Yeah, I got the I agent know. requirement. The, we, the thing we require of you as an agent. No, I said the number one thing is to be coachable. And that that's really more, I think that, if I said three, I screwed it up. You said there were three and then you only gave us one. Oh, I probably, what I meant is I was going to go to these three things. Sorry, I, I probably, what I meant is these are the three things that, but then I probably remembered, oh yeah, I wanted to say the number one thing is be coachable. So sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. No, there's, that, there's not three other things. Number one, most important thing, maybe I shouldn't say number one, most important thing for you guys is just be coachable. Be willing to come and say, I need help. Be willing to listen when somebody is giving you some things. And then ultimately, I would just say participate too. I mean, just come and get involved. I mean, I hope I've sent the message enough of like the importance of coming and participating on to Morning's Ascent, the base camps, all those things. You know, just a lot of times we feel like, oh, I think I, you know, I've got it, or I've heard George tell the message, or John, or me, or whoever. And in reality, I'll tell you, after two years of being here, almost every single day, I think I'm starting to understand. 
Like, don't say, I still wouldn't say, I got it figured out. I'm just starting to understand. I'm going to ask you a question because you do have a large group here, various ages. And I would like to know, being a, a coach, a teacher, a trainer for many years, have you seen people succeed when their goal, their purpose, their vision is a dollar figure, or does it need to be broader? Something bigger. So Why, what they're going to have when they have the dollar figure? I'm so, just asking. Yes. No, I know exactly what you're saying. Here's what business I. Business plans, we tend to have them focus on a dollar figure. I have found in my experience that it has to be broader. It has to be what is it you're going to have or do when you have the. It has to be more than the dollar figure. Yeah. $100, so thousand dollars a year. To answer the question, I would say, have I seen people do it with just the dollar? Yes, absolutely. Because and still successful. because well, but I would say that there's fewer people that do that because because I would say again outside of of Everest, there's not a lot that talk about this. So no. there are people that are successful that that's all they do is set the goal. So I would I think it would be arrogant to say, oh no, you'll never make it without. But but hundred percent, I agree with you that for the majority, the overall, it's this, because otherwise we get complacent. And I'll tell you, for me personally, I was guilty of that. When I first started in the business, once I became the top agent in the office that I was in, I was satisfied. And You got the trophy. Yeah. It's like, what exactly. more do I do? Exactly. And instead, if I would have really sat down and done this to figure out, like, how do I really, what is it that I really want out of just, not real estate, in, but just life kind of a thing, and put together that, I would have done better. I suspect that without the first level, purpose, why, and dreams, we can't maintain the goal, plan, and schedule, which is why we have such a high failure rate. That's right. Yeah, no, I'd agree. All right, so last thing. Here's what, I just want to speak to these things that are on the wall over here as part of this for you guys. So kind of just explaining what, where it came from, the purpose of it. So this self-confidence form, how many of you, I don't know if I asked, how many of you have read Think and Grow Rich? So a little, a few more. Okay, so which again, that, that one actually is on YouTube. You can go and just listen to it online. And Napoleon Hill's got some stuff in that Think and Grow Rich that's kind of out there a little bit that you're kind of like, oh, I don't know about some of those things. But 95% of it's all awesome, good stuff. But contained in the book, Think and Grow Rich, is this self-confidence formula. And at the end of it, you'll see down here, it says, I will sign my name to this formula, commit to memory, and pre aloud once a day with full faith that it will gradually influence my thoughts and actions, so I'll become a self-reliant, successful person. Essentially what happened, kind of the background of, of this, was Andrew Carnegie, who is the steel magnet, basically, hired Napoleon Hill to go out and interview all these people. Go talk to all these people to figure out what was it that made them successful. So he goes and does all of this research to figure out what caused all these people to be a success and essentially what he came up with, this would be the sum of what he came up with is this is what it takes to be successful. And, and you'll notice on here that um, number four on here, I have a clearly down, clearly written down a description of my definite chief aim in life. That's essentially what this is. This is your purpose, why, and things. Is what is your chief aim in life? Bruce Lee, actually, you can find online Bruce Lee's, his definite uh, chief aim, or I, I think he might call it definite purpose if I remember right. But he actually sat down and wrote out how he wanted to become this famous actor before he was an actor. And he was going to do it through martial arts. And he did. He had written down exactly how much he wanted to earn, $10 million. And he had it all written out. And he went and did exactly all of those things. So this self-confidence formula, the reason we repeat it every day as part of Morning Ascend is it's tied to Napoleon Hill went out and interviewed all these successful people and essentially is saying, if you want to be successful, this is how you do it. Do these five things that he's got listed here and memorize that and repeat it aloud once a day, believing you can do it. Okay, so next is the 12 step summit of success. Essentially what John and George did is sit down and said, we gotta come up with this formula. We talked about a recipe. There's the recipe to success. If you want to, what they, what they have come up with is it is a guarantee for 24 plus transactions a year. If you will follow those 12 things. 
that part of the system tool? I would say, yeah, that would be I, part I of I try to match yeah. things together. Yeah, no, that's great. So dedicating one hour daily towards building, protecting your self-confidence. That's going to be all of this stuff we're here talking about here, reading, listening to, associating with, all those things. Practicing internal audits your sales skills for a minimum of an hour, hour each day. So practicing these sales skills. Again, the reason I had you rate these is now that you've got them rated, find somebody that will practice these things with you. So that's where this is talking about. Work on those things, okay? Next, contact your sphere of influence by mail, by phone, and, and or in person and by email quarterly. So, not email. Quarterly. Oh, it does say email quarterly. That's funny, because we teach it as mail quarterly, yeah, email monthly. What? They all say that. Like the little ones too. Oh, they? Yeah, we got to fix that because that's not right. But <laughs> anyway, um, 150 How plus. Should it be that you should be emailing monthly and mail quarterly? And Good. And and actual person, How often? Uh, quarterly. Quarterly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, 150 plus contacts a week or 30 plus per day on that so follow up with all my qualified leads daily obviously that's actually one of the funniest things to me about this business we work really hard to generate leads and then we don't follow up with them like it makes zero sense but that's what happens in this business all right set five plus two appointments each week so basically one a day completely pre-qualify 100 percent of your appointments now pre-qualifying doesn't mean you don't go on them just pre-qualifying is just at, go through and ask the questions, which again, we've got them here in the script book, the pre-qualifying questions. That doesn't mean you don't have to go on the appointment. It's just you'll at least know going out there where you're at, okay? Um, have an appointment's attending listening ratio of at least 50% or greater. Why would we say it that way? Like to me, when I first read that, I was like, an, an appointment's attended the listening ratio of 50% or greater. I'm like, that's not very good. 50%, like in my mind, I'm like, that's not that great. Why would we say it at 50? Why are we not saying 75 or 80%? Because it involves other people's agency. You can set appointments and they can sound really good. They might just have a life event change or change their mind or just been filling you full of smoke. You don't know. Okay. I would say that's part of it for sure. Yeah. Some appointments fall, fall, fall out. That's, you've got two people there, the customer okay. being so and I would agree although that says appointments attended to listings taken so meaning the ones you do attend so I, I hear where you but that's where I guess I'm coming from of like at first I was like why would we say 50% or greater because like if I go on the appointment I'm not expecting to get like worse than half like to me I expect and and I would look back I'll, I'll kind of give you some hints here as I look back on my career I would say like I was probably closer to 80 or 90 percent of the appointments I went on I got the listing so what was the problem the problem is you were weeding out ones that you could have should have maybe gone on that so the point is don't just go on the ones that you think you're gonna get going on ones that you maybe aren't but maybe there's still something there okay good I think that's part of it for sure I, maybe I'm dreaming this up but I thought 15 to 20 percent was like the industry average for for uh, taken to listings taken I, I don't think so in fact I would guess my guess would be the industry average is going to be much higher than 50% and it's for the reason that I'm kind of like leading you guys down to and here's what I would say that the reason when, it for it is when there might be interviewing four or five agents for their well but if you look at the NAR statistics not very often do people interview more than one agent like 60 something percent of the time they're interviewing one agent. So if 60 percent of the time they're interviewing one agent, we should be saying 60 percent, shouldn't we? So why would we say it should be around 50 percent or greater? Encouragement. So part of it actually what it is is we, we are not going on enough appointments, meaning we typically are only going on the appointments of, uh, it's along the lines of what Eric's saying, is we're only going on the ones we know we're going to get, but really more so of that, it's usually the people that basically we already know we're going out there to get the listing. We're not going in, on enough people that we don't know appointments. Does that make sense? Like the reason, most of my business was all SOI. So that's why I, when I first read it, I'm like 50%. Like if I only listed 50%, I would feel like I was horrible. But it was because I was only going on very qualified. Very, the people that, instead of reaching outside of that sphere of influence as well. 
I was just going to say actually a story about this from yesterday where, and, and I probably set myself up to fail because of, the, of exactly that, where I did my pre listing phone call and she had said that she probably wasn't going to list with me when I came out, but it was only because she was analytical and she just needed the information. Yeah. Well, before I really figured out why or what she needed to get, I kind of had already dismissed, oh, well, I'm just not going to go out then. And I really think I hurt my opportunity. I still ended up going out, but I had to backpedal, fix the issue that I had caused, then go out. And, you know, while in her head she may have been like, well, I'm going to end up listing with this guy, I may have created something. And, and, and now I've dropped my statistic, whereas if I had just gone out, and found out what it was that she wanted. Good. I I really probably could have gotten the listing even yesterday, but and I still have a chance. But it, it the the fact that in my mind I had already kind of made up that well I'm, I'm probably not going to get this listing, so I shouldn't go out there. Really hurt my chances of getting the listing. Yeah. Because that's what I set as the expectation. Perfect. So don't do that. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That. All right. Next. I, I call my sellers weekly and reduce all listings every three weeks a minimum of 5%. Again, on that, most agents, well, I don't know if I'd say most. It's imperative that you call your sellers weekly, even if you got nothing to tell them, okay? So, um, tip, 70, I sell 75% or more of my listing inventory. Again, that's going to be tied to pricing, making sure you're getting a price right. The reason, again, that's at 75% is, I'll tell you, I've been out on listings where I've been like, this is priced so good, it's going to sell so quick, and then it never sells. And I've had the other way where I've been like, there is no way this will sell. And the first day you get multiple offers, and you're like, I don't get it. So 75% so or more. Return every sign, call and contact every buyer lead within two hours of inquiry. Why would we want you to do that? Time is into the essence. That's right. You don't, your best chance of capturing them is going to be right away. And then last, only work with highly qualified buyers who have been pre-qualified by a mortgage lender and signed a buyer broker agreement. So if you will follow those 12 things, guarantee 24 plus transactions each year. You'll just do that. So if you're doing less than 24 transactions, look at that and go, okay, where do I need to improve then? What do I need to do? Okay. Next one there is Tony Robbins. Anybody been to Tony Robbins? Oh, you, you got to go. Have you been to it? Unleash well, the power with him? He's at, no, I don't know if that particular conference, but he's Oh, you would know if you went. Did you walk on, on Colts? Yeah, you had to walk on Colts. Well, he had people come up, but not everybody there. Oh, well, then you, that wasn't Unleash the Power Within. So I would recommend going to that. Again, we say this every day, but if you want to really have that have some meaning to you, go to one of the Tony Robbins events and is the Unleash the Power Within. It is. That will take on a whole new meaning for you when you go through that, uh, through the Unleash the Power Within. It's awesome. So anyway, that's why we do that. Um, and it'll make more sense if you go and, and do it. Um, and then the affirmations, obviously we've got the opening and closing affirmations, is the idea of that is we say enough negative self things to ourselves all day long that the idea of that is to get some positive things going. So anyway, all right. That's all I've got, unless you guys have questions comments I just wanted to say I've been in the workforce for 40 years now and I, this is the first company I've ever worked for where they actually walk the walk instead of just talking the talk thank you yeah I would agree yeah it's that's one of the things that's impressive to me is if if I'm not even sure that I fully understand but if you guys understood how busy George is and in, in looking to acquire companies and what he's trying to do the fact that he shows up here at 8 o'clock in the morning to do a morning ascent when he's in town, I mean, if he's in town, you can pretty much guarantee he will be here doing the morning ascent. That is pretty impressive when the owner of the company has still that much of a belief to the importance of it that he personally is here doing it when he can. So, yeah, all I agree with you. All of you resonates from all of you, actually. Thank somehow. you. Yeah. You were saying when it comes to the skill sets and you need to work on something, get with somebody, who do we get with? Either a broker, so you could come and get with me and say, hey, I want to do it, or you can get with each other and say, hey, you know, help me, let's role play and practice doing some objection handling or lead follow up or whatever. So, but yeah, any of that, I'd be happy to schedule a time to sit down with you and go through stuff. Anytime, so, yeah, let me know. No, okay.
Okay. Thanks for being here. So Thursday is the mortgage, so uh, Citywide's going to be doing it, which I think that's pretty cool what he said today about if you will do the things that he says, it's going to make your deals happen quicker. So, Kim? Well, the last time they did the mortgage one, um, you weren't here, so I don't know if we have like, a sign-up for it. Do you know? Because I remember it was... That is possible. Yeah, I don't know. I can look that up okay. and see if I did get a sign-in on it or not. Because I don't remember. Because how will we... Well, I will be here Thursday. Well, I know, but I know I took it before. Is it oh, okay. But I, there wasn't a sign-up because you weren't here. Okay. Do you remember, do you remember that? I do. Sounds familiar. I, I was here too. Okay. okay. I believe you then. I wasn't here. So I was, it would have been three months ago or so. Yes, it was. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, in fact, will you just write a note on here, if you guys will? That I'm not that sure if awesome. we, like, made one up. If we, like, I don't, I'll look back and check to Do see. I don't remember. remember. If we, like, we yeah. Uh, I don't just, if you'll, oh, I don't know why I handed it to you. <laughs> well, I've already done it, too. Oh, then just write it down. Yeah, if you guys will write it down, then, uh. I'll mark it off. Okay. So is the mortgage class a CE class or? No. It's just a graduating, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's just, yeah. It's not a CE. Just to help you guys understand what goes on on the back end so that, uh, that at, like Rick said, it will help you get your deals closed quicker. It will be things you can do to help along the way with your clients and stuff. So. Okay. Thanks for being here. Thanks. I'll be here on Thursday. <laughs> At least at the start. Okay. So, were we supposed to get something for those the last CE? Did you remember my course? From um, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess I should make up the certificates. I, I've recorded it. Um, it's, if you go to the division, it should be showing now. Do we have um, something assigned to the division? Uh huh. Separate too? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, which I probably should make up the certificates. I just haven't done that. Okay, I Thank you. So I should. Thanks. In fact, I'm going to do that. I will go through and make up the certificate because I need to get those. That was just there. That way people know. I know. It's fabulous. Uh, I don't. This is probably.